One of the most popular questions that I get asked as an American living in Poland is, why Poland? Part of the reason is because I have distant relatives that live here and I wanted to get to know them better. So one weekend, I decided to go and pay my great aunt a visit. Now I didn't know this at the time, but my great aunt's home was actually heated by a coal burning furnace. When I went to visit her, she brought me to the basement and I saw the furnace. I saw the tall piles of coal sitting in the corners of the room, and I saw a haze of black particles drifting through the air in front of me. As someone who had never seen this type of heating system before, I had so many questions. But when I tried to ask my aunt about them, I had to ask her in Polish. Now, according to Duolingo, I am an expert in the Polish language. But somehow, Despite this fantastic accomplishment, our interaction still went a little something like, how old is the, 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 and I would point at the furnace because I had forgotten or more likely never actually learned the word for coal burning furnace in Polish. How much of the, the black stuff do you, uh, you know? She laughed jumped at the opportunity to make a pun and said, I think all this dust is starting to give you zakurzona pamięć, or dusty memory. I laughed at my great aunt's joke, but only for a second, because as I noticed the thick black particles swimming through the basement air, I started to feel a little worried. I began to wonder if these particles could somehow get inside my body, or even worse, my brain. What if these tiny particles of coal and ash really could lodge themselves in there, disrupting functions like my memory or my ability to focus? I had already heard about how smog could cause headaches, so maybe there really was reason to worry. I decided to learn more. As a Fulbright research scholar studying air pollution at the University of Poland, I was in a pretty good place to find some answers. And so if you know anything about smog, you might have heard the term particulate matter used before. Particulate matter is a major constituent of air pollution, and it consists of a huge number of chemicals that are widely considered to be very bad for human health. And actually, in a lot of ways, particulate matter pollution in the body is like plastic pollution in the ocean. Plastic comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Think straws, plastic bottles, plastic bags, soda can rings, and candy wrappers. And while we try to recycle our plastic waste, some of it still gets into the ocean, harming the wildlife and the creatures that live there. In a very similar way, particulate matter comes in a variety of shapes and sizes, and while our lungs try to prevent these particles from getting into our deeper organs, some particles still get through, depositing themselves in places like our liver, spleen, kidneys, and yes, even the brain. Think of it like a sea turtle, choking on a plastic bag, or a dead seagull with fishing wire wrapped around its beak. But particulate matter is an invisible killer, responsible for a long list of diseases that ultimately culminate in the tragic loss of human life. Last year alone, particulate matter caused 45,000 Polish people to die premature deaths. And next year's number is expected to be even higher. The terrifying efficiency with which particulate matter is able to harm us is devastating. The way that it's able to bypass our body's defenses and get into our vital organs should worry us. Particulate matter is an objectively bad thing, responsible for the premature deaths of millions of people across the world. But in the same breath, you might almost feel a sense of awe for something so powerful. You might wonder where that power comes from, and if you think long enough about it, you might came, come to the same thought that I came to when I began researching this invisible killer. What if we could turn something that takes lives into something that saves them instead? But before we can learn how something might help us, we first need to understand exactly how it harms us. Now, the unfortunate reality 
is that we're not entirely sure how particulate matter is able to get into our vital organs, but we have some pretty good theories. The most popular theory suggests that particles of a sufficiently small size are able to diffuse through the cells that make up the air-blood barriers in our lungs. Once in the bloodstream, these particles can travel to most of the organs in our body. While some of these particles are captured and removed by our body's defenses, some aren't, and those are the ones that make it to our organs. Now, this theory isn't popular because it's revolutionary. This theory is popular because it's built on some very defining principles of medicine that are employed in a variety of fields. One example is the use of particles not to cause diseases, but rather to treat them. These kinds of medicines are made of engineered nanoparticles. In medicine, nanoparticles are particles of an extremely small size, roughly smaller than cells but larger than atoms, that we equipped with the tools to accomplish a wide variety of tasks in the human body. These tools are typically attached to the surfaces of the nanoparticles. But because of their incredibly small size, nanoparticles can be a little difficult to picture. So instead, I want you to imagine an army of tiny soldiers. One tool that these nano-sized mites might be able to come equipped with is a sword, allowing them to fight off any dangerous cells that they encounter on their journeys. Another might be a shield to protect them from the body's defenses. One accessory might act as a key, allowing the particle access to some of the body's most impenetrable cells. In short, nanoparticles need to be designed to survive in an environment that is determined to destroy them. And so you can see that when we design nanoparticles using the vast freedoms that they come equipped with, I don't want you to limit yourself to only those that we make in a lab. In truth, nanoparticles exist all around us in nature. When we begin to look for them and learn about how they work, we find the inspiration to engineer new nanoparticles that accomplish more than we ever thought possible. And so, right now, I want you to consider the question that I posed earlier. What if we could find a way to turn something that takes lives into something that saves them instead? In other words, what if we could determine how particulate matter is able to get into our vital organs and then use that information to design more effective medicines? This idea isn't new. Cone snails that live in the open ocean produce a deadly poison that is surprisingly good at treating certain heart conditions. Snake and spider venom can have multiple medicinal properties when used in small enough doses. Now, I don't mean to say that particulate matter itself has any medicinal properties, but rather, using nature as our inspiration, can we design better medicines using the special tools that make particulate matter so effective? So if we're going to ask air pollution to solve our problems, where do we start? My recommendation is to start at the end, the end of our knowledge. Where is nanomedicine stumped in the modern age? And what lessons can we draw from particulate matter that might be applicable in these situations? To start, we can talk about target specificity in drug delivery. Now, one day, people are going to look back at us and call us nanomedical Neanderthals. While our method for targeting cells in the human body is built on an enormous body of research and has been developed thanks to some of the most prolific nanomedical developments to date, our current method of administering nanoparticles is a bit like throwing a handful of darts at a wall and hoping that you get a bullseye. When we inject nanoparticles, we inject them into the bloodstream and we gener generally inject as many as we can that don't constitute a threat to the patient's health. We then hope that a significant number find the disease cells and act appropriately. In this way, the nanoparticles that are sent on this quest disperse themselves throughout the entire human body instead of honing in on the specific location where they're needed. As a result, many nanoparticles never find the dragon that they were designed to slay, and some might even go on to harm perfectly healthy cells by mistake. And so, when I thought of this idea, 
I wanted to consider how nanomedicine and particulate matter came together. We can think of many different occasions in the ways that they're produced. Um, as someone who's been studying particulate matter, I know that each piece is sort of like a seashell. Particulate matter is created by such a wide variety of chemical sources, environmental factors, and weather conditions that no two pieces are ever exactly the same. This made me think of how we make nanoparticles. When we produce nanoparticles, we tend to produce them in bulk, which means that each one has roughly different properties of shape and size. This is actually a big problem. In the pharmaceutical industry, the ability to meticulously produce enormous amounts of therapeutic compounds with immense precision and reproducibility is oftentimes a baseline requirement for regulatory approval. Medical nanomedicines need to be developed with the correct properties of shape and size to ensure that they function as designed. Unfortunately, many processes struggle to design particles with sufficiently similar properties. And so when I saw this um, similarity between particulate matter and nanoparticles, I began to wonder if our inability to produce nanoparticles with sufficiently similar properties was one of the reasons that we don't see more of them ending up where they should in the human body. Consider air pollution, for example. When you breathe in particulate matter, you breathe in a mixture of different particles that look very different from one another. As a result, they behave very differently as well. Some make it past the body's defenses, some don't. Some travel to the liver, others travel to the spleen. But if we take a closer look at the particles that do make it to these organs, will we see a pattern? Will particles of one shape and size tend to collect in the liver, while particles of another shape and size combination tend to prefer the spleen? In other words, do sea turtles tend to go after plastic bags specifically, or will they eat whatever floats their way? In the end, it may very well be that there is no correlation between particle properties and their final destination in the human body, but it's worth looking into. For a long time, these weren't really questions that we were able to answer. Partly because tracking particles in the human body is such a difficult task, especially given their small size. But as nanomedicine has progressed, so too has nanomedical imaging. In order to get a better idea of where these particles go and how they get there, a lab from Tsinghua University in China conducted an experiment that allowed them to visualize tiny particles of synthetic particulate matter in the bodies of mice using a fluorescent imaging agent. When viewed under a microscope, these particles fluoresced, allowing the researchers to localize them at given points in time. As you might expect, lots of particles were confined to the lungs, but particles were also observed in different parts of the body of the mice. Now, while the researchers didn't go on to try to classify the size and shape of these particles in specific organs, their experiment shows that we have the tools in our capacity to do so. One day, when we can meticulously control the properties of the particles that we synthesize, we'll be able to know if particles of a particular size and shape are able to preferentially deposit themselves in specific organs. If this hypothesis is true, then we'll be able to use this information to develop more localized medicines that are more effective at treating diseases and cause less damage to the body as a whole. At, whereas nanomedicines today mainly focus on injectable treatments, imagine the day where you can breathe in your vaccines instead of facing a needle. Maybe we'll be treating autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's, or even cancer in the same way that we use an inhaler. If we're lucky, tomorrow's medicines might just be saving lives with the same chemistry that brought them so close to death in the first place. But what if we can't wait until tomorrow? Already, we are drowning in a thick, black sea of smog. In some places, the air is so laden with particles that we might as well be turtles choking on plastic bags. Air pollution threatens each and every single one of us, and it's not going to get better until you get up and decide to do something about it. Look into the ways that you contribute to the problem. Look at where particulate matter comes from. You'll find lots of it in the exhaust of cars and industrial power plants. 
But as is the case with so many households in Poland, the single largest contributor and source of particulate matter is the old and outdated coal-burning furnaces in our very own homes. Burning coal, wood, or trash is to blame for about half of Poland's particulate matter air pollution. That's a huge chunk. So when you leave here today, I want you to think about what you can do to reduce the amount of particulate matter that you contribute. Don't burn solid fuels or trash. Upgrade your heating system to greener, more efficient models. Invest in your local renewable energy sector. Use public transport, carpool, or bike to school. And if, at times, choosing to fight air pollution becomes inconvenient, remember that you are helping to prevent the loss of human life. You are choosing to act with empathy. Now, most of us in this room are probably too young to remember the days when Poland enjoyed clean air. But if we continue to pollute our environments at the current pace, Pretty soon, we might all be suffering from a dusty memory. Thank you. <laughs>